Hey, everybody, we've got a great show for you today. If you've ever thought about writing a book, writing a novel, and you just aren't sure where to start, today's show is going to be definitely great for you. Even if you've written a novel, written a book, this show is going to be great for you. So tune in. We're going to be talking to Jennifer Ann Gordon, and she's a Kindle award-winning author of Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, as well as the Hotel Sur series as well as her new release, Pretty Ugly. We're going to be talking about that today. She's also a professional ballroom dancer, artist, as well as the host of the top-rated video podcast, Vox Vomitus, which I can't wait to, under to hear what that's all about. So, Jennifer, welcome. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here today and talk about all your projects that you're working on. How's everything going today? It's going great, Linda. Thank you for having me. Well, first, I want to get right into the ballroom dancing. Let's let's start with that. So how did you get into ballroom dancing? Um, I've seen, you know, so many people that just look so elegant out there. And my husband and I tried it. And, you know, I must admit, we totally sucked. So I'm just curious, how did you get into ballroom dancing? Well, I was always a dancer. So I started dancing when I was about three and I did jazz tap and ballet and then just jazz up until uh, about high school. And then I had some knee injuries. Uh, I went to college for theater and majored in acting. And I worked professionally on stage for about five years. But then I kind of left that behind and focused on visual art and doing other things. And then I'd always wanted to ballroom dance. And it took a long time for me to just kind of build up the courage to just like walk in and take a lesson because I'd never danced with somebody in my arms before. Um, so, so that was interesting because I guess since I was so used to dancing by myself, I think I was like a born leader. Uh, so I started ballroom dancing. That is where I met my now husband. And uh, I started just as a student and about six months after that, maybe eight months after that, the studio that I was taking lessons at hired me as an instructor. And then I've just been performing and uh, teaching and choreographing ever since. That's awesome. That's fast. That's fast to go from, you know, student all the way to instructor. So you must be a fast, fast learner at things that you're learning. But yeah. Um, I, I think I am. But I think so much of teaching ballroom dance or really teaching anything is having a good personality and having a good way to communicate with people and being able to um very quickly put somebody at ease because you know our students tend to be older 50 to 75 usually is the average age for somebody who's learning to ballroom dance and you know by the time you get to be a grown-up like you're in your 50s you probably have spent a lot of time in your life convincing yourself you can't do things so most people walk in the ballroom dance studio saying i am going to be terrible at this and it's my job to make sure they know that they they don't have to be terrible at it. And they're probably not going to be terrible at it. Um, it's just going to be a different journey. That's great. That's I love how you put that because it's so true. I know uh, when we first you know, tried that ballroom dancing, I was about 40 something, 45 or so. But you're right, because we tend to beat ourselves up, you know, as we get older and older and older. And then when you reach a certain age, things are harder than they were yes. uh, you know, when you were younger. And so now you move into that space of, you know, I don't think I can do it. I'm not sure if I should even try it. And one of the things I love to talk about is you're never too old to start something new because at 51, I started my entrepreneurial journey and, you know, it, it started at that age. So you really are never too, yeah. too old to try something new. And I like that idea, you know, doing that ballroom dancing and having somebody like you that can hold their hand and make them feel comfortable through that. But how did you, how did you get into writing? Writing. I know we were talking a little bit before we got started about how, you know, you did, you were a reader, you know, when you were in high school, I myself was more like a, a boy ogler and you're not really into <laughs> reading or anything. So I'm curious, like, how did you get into reading? Have you always been an avid reader or have you been yeah. always a writer? How did you get into that? Um, probably both, but I was very much an avid reader. Um, I learned to read when I was two. And so that's like really abnormally young. So I started school when I was three and I was just devouring any of like the kids books humanly possible. Then in first grade, um, I had just barely turned six and I read all of the Nancy Drew books in the library, just like devoured them. Um, 
I just loved reading so much. I, I don't know if it was because I was an only child and I didn't have a lot of people to like play with when I was a kid. And I was actually pretty quiet. So uh, losing myself in a book was always so much fun. Uh, just like living in a different world for a little while. And in third grade, I won like a little writing contest where I had to write a prayer. I went to a Catholic school and uh, I wrote a prayer for a kitten. I remember that. And it ended up in like the little newspaper. And so that was the first time I saw my name in print. And I think I was just like ruined from that moment on that I was just like, I want to see my name in print again. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. Congratulations. Started reading it too. I mean, that's... <laughs> That's a little bit young. Uh, you know, a lot of kids aren't even really walking very well at that age. So yeah, that's, that's I was awesome. really late too. But yeah, I remember this. I was my mother was reading to me. And then I just grabbed the book out of her hand and started reading. And she thought I had memorized it. So then she handed me a different book. And, you know, it was like tricky. I obviously didn't read very good. But uh, I was able to sound out the words and kind of understand them. And it's, oh, it's so been cool. funny. I talk to so many authors uh, and a lot of them have like these stories of like learning to read at a very abnormal age, like two and three. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. So the, to find that there is some sort of connection there, right, between uh, writers and you know, authors and and time of learning to read. That's so fascinating. I myself didn't even start writing until I was after 51 because I you know, told myself that I wasn't any good. I couldn't write. I used to always say, I can't write. I can't write. I've said that for decades. And it, those are actually stories that other people told me that I adopted myself or my own belief, which is, you know, I think it's very common for people to do that, which is unfortunate, but it doesn't mean we can't ever start. And that's, again, you know, I, right. why I love that since you are never too old to start something new. And so let's talk about your, your recent book that just came out and that is a uh, pretty ugly. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Like, um, I do. So yes. About? <laughs> so pretty ugly. Um, I came up with the idea pre COVID. So I'm sorry, it's about a, a virus. Uh, but pretty ugly follows two characters. One of them is an Instagram influencer named Amelia. And the other is a failed politician named Sam. And both of them are leading these lives that are pretty much fictionalized versions of themselves. Uh, Omelia, that's not even her real name, but when she was young, she suffered um, some childhood tragedies and childhood traumas. And becoming Omelia, becoming this Instagram influencer was her way of healing herself without ever healing. And Sam, our failed politician, he had uh, a childhood grief. He lost his twin sister when, they, when he was very young. And he was he was kind of brought up with the idea that the, he was the worst of the twins so the wrong twin died so he's done a lot of damage to himself with self-doubt and a lot of allowing himself to be bullied into a life he never wanted to lead so i have these two characters their stories seemingly are not connected uh but when we meet them it is during like the the weekend of this incredible virus that like ravages the world. And in this virus, it affects people's uh, faces specifically, where um, I don't want to say it's like flesh eating bacteria, but it does cause like a meningitis meets an Ebola kind of effect on their face. So they become incredibly sick and also um, physically scarred. So if people do survive this virus, um, they're left not quite looking obviously the way they looked before. So um, so the book is about that. It's about when all you are is a face, what happens when you can't be a face anymore? And it's the story of these two people figuring out if they can forgive themselves for their pasts, forgive other people for their pasts and figure out if they are capable and willing to love or connect with somebody else um, while the world is actively ending and people are dying all around them. Wow. Wow. How do you come up with a story like that? I mean, that's, were you just like sleeping one night and you woke up, you know, I have an idea for a, for a story. 
You know, this story actually came about because when I was in high school, I had really, really, really terrible skin. Um, I still have a lot of skin problems. And I just remember I would get like cellulitis on my face and it was just like horrifying. Like my face would be so red and swollen and painful. And I would have teachers asking me if somebody in my life was hitting me and I wasn't being hit. It was just what was going on with my face. And I remember just thinking like, oh, I wish I could wear a mask so nobody would see how bad my skin is. Um, cut to a couple years ago, uh, my husband and I were in a store, just like a convenience store, and the girl working at the register had cellulitis on her face. And she wasn't wearing a mask. And, you know, like you could tell she was kind of like sheepishly, like keeping her head down. And, you know, it just reminded me of how I felt in high school. And, you know, then my husband and I were talking about it because he was like, oh my gosh, what was on her? Like, I feel so bad for her. And I was like, it was cellulitis. And, and you know, and he and I talked about it and he said something like, you know, I wish like people who take their looks for granted could like, that could happen to them just for like an hour one day or two hours. Just so they, everybody could figure out how that felt like that, like, painful embarrassment of having something wrong with your face. Um, so that's kind of where the story started. And again, this was pre COVID and I was writing other projects, but I was like developing this story in my head and I started writing it during COVID, but the idea and everything came about before it. So I tried not to let COVID affect it too much. Uh, but there's, of course, I think there were still shades of, of that in there and I think people can really relate to the story now especially that we've yeah. you know we're all kind of like going through this incredible trauma as an entire planet we're all sharing the same collective grief yeah well that's so do you like and then all the stories that you write do they incorporate part of your own life or um do you come up with different ideas that aren't like just like ideas that uh, were imagination. You imagine and imagine. I'm going to say the word imaginatory, but I don't even know if that's a word. So I'm going to say it anyway. They're um, imaginatory. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it's both. I think that the ideas are not something necessarily that have happened to me, but there's a little bit of me in every character I write. Like, like even the villains, I think there's there's a shade of of me in there. You know, whether it's just like a personal detail, a memory from my childhood, um, something's there, I think, to uh, to make them part of me. That's so cool. Now, when you were writing that story, because you're bringing up parts in your life that were, um, you know, potentially very harmful mentally, you know, during that that time, uh, when you were writing that, did any stuff come up that was maybe hidden and, you know, down down deep in your soul that came up mm. while you were writing that? Um, you know, yes and no. There were no deep, dark secrets, but um, the book Pretty Ugly does deal a lot with grief. Um, I like I like writing about grief. I find it like incredibly fascinating. Most of my other books, like even Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent and the Hotel series, have grief as, as their core horror moment, their horror you know, inciting incident, if you will. So I think with Pretty Ugly, it wasn't so much that I was discovering things I didn't know, but I was discovering new ways to channel a grief story and new ways to get to um, emotions that I hadn't used before. Okay, okay, that that's interesting. Now that, um, you saw that lady in the store and her, you know, hiding her face. Um, did you, uh, you know, again, I'm just curious about the, any emotions that came up for you when your husband mentioned that, because that brought to, brought to the surface, you know, uh, your, your own experiences at, you know, younger. And I'm just curious, did that bring up anything for you at that time? Um, you know, nothing that I don't already kind of access on, I don't want to say a daily basis, but I have spent, you know, several years kind of 
working through kind of trauma and working through um, things from my childhood, things from my teenage years. I take a lot of uh, grief writing classes and a lot of memoir writing classes. So I find, um, and I do this just so I can have like more tools in my writer tool belt. Like it's not like it's therapy, but I like to be able to access um, easily and not as painfully um, some darker memories if that makes any sense because there's ways to yeah, kind of yeah. access this information without it being like trauma porn because sometimes people write books about like traumatic experiences and it's just like like 300 pages of a woe is me and it's hard to to read there's no lightness there um but i always find that there's like a very interesting way to get to certain information um where people don't even quite understand that they're reading a book about grief until probably the end and then they're just like oh yeah sure it was a ghost story but it wasn't but it was really a story about loss and okay sometimes yeah, the most I, frightening I like parts that, yeah. Of a, yeah like some sometimes the most frightening parts of a story about grief are not the ghosts or the grief itself it's that moment of are you willing to let all of that go and be a different person like are you even willing to heal that's the scariest yeah. part in like a grief horror story, because especially if it's such a defining part of like the character, like their whole persona is defined by these moments. Like, can you let it go? And who are you if you do? <laughs> like, so so I, I deal with yeah. a lot of like heavy emotional uh, stuff. So my wow. horror isn't I, a lot of like jump scares. It's more like psychological get in your head and uh, stay there for a while. That's fascinating. You know, I was telling um, Jennifer before we got started that, um, you know, I haven't read any of her books. because I like to go into interviews not knowing anything. And um, boy, this has really intrigued me to, to check out your books <laughs> because, yeah, because I, I love that. You know, I love. Um, I love horror flicks. You know, I'm more of like a movie buff than a, a reader, an avid reader. But I do love to read, but I love movies better for some reason. But with that said, um, you know, I do love a story that really brings out some sort of emotions. But, but I love how you say, you know, it's a subtle way. So it's not like hit you yeah. over the head, you know, with these emotions. Exactly. Really like, important. here, you've got to do yeah. this. Um, and yeah. I will say, if you like movies, I've heard people who read my books say that I it's written like a movie. I write incredibly lyrically so people can, you know, when they read it, they're just like, I just pictured it in my head. So I do that without it being overly descriptive as well. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think and, you, you know, would like them. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to check them out. And, you know, as, I, as I'm saying that, I'm realizing that you know, there's a lot of uh, books that I've read that came out on movies and I like the book way better. Yes. You know, I think that happens there, often. Yeah. It happens most of the time. So sometimes like I see a movie coming out and I really want to see it. But then when I find out that there's a book, I, I wait to watch the movie because, you know, I just like, I want to have that experience of reading the book. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, how'd you get into horror flick? You know, I'm sorry, horror flick, Hor you know, writing horror stories. Have you always been fascinated with horror or, or did you have yeah. a ghost visit you one time or what? Um, yes to all of that. Um, no, I've always loved horror. Like even when I was little, like I would read those like R.L. Stein, YA horror novels and Christopher Pike. And I read Stephen King's Pet Cemetery at a very early age which I definitely shouldn't have, but um, my uncle was living By with the us way, and he- that movie, that movie is banned from our household. <laughs> it's so, it's, you know, I, I picked that book up because like the old 1980s cover had a cat on the front and I picked it up because I thought, oh, it's, a, it's a, like a book for grownups, but it's about a cat. So right. like I, I took it up to my room and I started to read it and very quickly I realized it was not a story about a cat. Um, but I think that was the first time that I read anything that like scared the heck out of me, but also broke my heart at the same time because Pet Cemetery, at its core is a story about a father losing his son. Um, and, you know, wanting to do almost anything to get him back. So it's a story about grief at its core. So I think at that moment is when I, I kind of, I like the idea of grief horror and I love the idea of gothic fiction because gothic fiction just means that 
the past is still alive and it's haunting your present. So that can take any place. That could be a ghost. It could be a memory. It could just be an old family home that is, you know, falling apart and you just feel like drawn to keep it together. So I've just, yeah, I've always just been fascinated by horror and the past and it is the past really gone. I think it's William Faulkner. I'm going to massacre mm. the quote. He said, uh, the past is never really dead and it's not even the past. And cause he wrote Southern Gothic fiction and I just like loved it so much that I was like, yes, that's like, that's how I want to write this memory and horror. And, and I just loved horror wow. movies growing up too. Just like loved them. I still love them. Read horror novels. It's like my go-to genre. Oh, is it? That's, that's, I love, um, there's that one like called... suspense and crime. <laughs> Those are fun. I I know. I there's something about like there uh, things are just start moving in my body. You know when I read those kinds of stories. Yeah. You know the like you said suspense, crime, the horror. Amityville Horror is a book that I read uh, probably in like right after high school, like maybe right after I graduated high school. And that book scared the crap out of me. And then um, the movie Very. came out with James Brolin back in like maybe the early '80s or something. And now, I mean, it's so here's what's fascinating to me is that like, I read the book, it scared me. And I, like, I, I got to watch the movie because the book scared me. So I watched the movie and I watched it maybe, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven times. We bought it on a, um, on a cassette tape, you know, type of thingy yeah. and you know, VHS or something. And we were playing it. And then one day after probably watching it five, six times with my husband, one day I came home and my husband was watching the movie and I walked in the door and I heard the music and suddenly something just came over me and said, turn it off. Like I, I couldn't control it. It was something <laughs> oh that was gosh. so strong. I, I, I said, we cannot play that movie ever again, you know, because that music just yeah. pulls out all of that, that horror. And I believe yeah. that was based on a true story. And that's what it like, was really based on a true story. Oh, oh and there's like really cool documentaries about the Amityville house that are about um, the son that grew up in that house and how perhaps maybe he had, you know, mental illness problems and people might have been taking advantage of him. So there's like the Amityville thing. It's so cool. It's it's like it's just. I don't know. Like I, if you can find the documentary or I'll find the title of it and I'll send it to you, I'll email it to you. Okay, cool. I saw it a few years ago. Um, oh, I would love that. As long as it doesn't have that music in it, I think yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. I don't think it you does. Know, I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try it again. Like this been, it's been like 20 years since I said I banished that movie from our house. And so I might be able to handle it now, but it's interesting. You know, I'm a musician. I grew up as a musician, you know, playing flute and I played all kinds of instruments and stuff. And now I play bass guitar, you know, but um, it's cool. interesting how music can really, really bring out some sort of emotion, emotion. inside of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So anyway, that especially one, as a musician, because you relate to it so much that like, because my husband's a musician as well. And he always like when he hears like a film score, he's just like, oh, that's so good. And and like he really like like you just like hits on the music of it. Whereas I think uh, as an author, like when I hear music, I always like hear the lyrics of it first. And if the lyrics get me. So. Okay, well, how about this one? Summer loving. Have me a blast. <laughs> <laughs> not a fan of Greece. I will say that. <laughs> not not the best of lyrics, but, <laughs> but still great music. It is catchy. <laughs> yeah. I, lo I love that. I love that um, that whole movie for some reason. I don't know. It's just <laughs> fun for because it's a musical. That's why. I so know. anyway, let's let's get back to Pretty Ugly. So people can go to your website, Jennifer and Gordon, and, and get a copy of Pretty Ugly read it, read, leave reviews. Uh, so what's next for you? Do you have like this one just released recently? So what's next for you? Yes. Do you have anything in the pipeline? Um, I do. I do have something in the pipeline, but I can't really talk about it, which I know is like sounds so silly. Um, I know. Um, so I 
have recently signed with a literary agent. And so this is the idea that I had pitched to her and she loved it and she wanted me to focus on that. So I'm about 70,000 words into that project, but I'm like under tight wraps to like not talk about what it is. I can say that it's not a horror novel, but I- Oh, well that just like narrows it down. I know, now narrows it down to like, it could be anything but horror. Um, So yeah, I'm working on that. And so I have no idea when that will be out, probably not for a few years, because I would have to, I have to sell it after this. But I'm always working on other things. I'm working um, also on like a a haunted house story that I might be able to, that might see the light of day before the other one, I'm not sure. Um, And I, I'm writing some memoir essays and memoir poetry pieces too. So. Well, fantastic. I love it. I'm excited to order my copy, jenniferangordon.com. That's Ann with an E. You guys go yes. there, jenniferangordon.com. I'll put a link down you know, below and yes. click on that and go from there. Books. Yeah, you, you can find the link to, so from my website, you can find the link to buy it wherever your preferred bookseller is. I know some people for Amazon, but it's also available at bookshop.org and IndieBound. So that way it will support your local independent bookseller uh, and not just a billionaire. And uh, if you wanted an autographed copy, they are available at gibsonsbookstore.com. And that is also on my website. Fantastic. And and that's, you know, she's telling the truth about that Amazon thing because literally when you sell a book on Amazon, you get about like 38 cents or something. You're likely if you get a couple yeah. of bucks. <laughs> and so you know, not a lot of money I, in I, Amazon I, book sales. And, you know, and there's not a lot of money in book sales uh, to begin with, but I'd rather if, I, if somebody's getting a big chunk of this money, I'd rather it be a, a small bookstore that it has been. They've been struggling yeah. through COVID. They've been struggling for years, but um, especially through COVID. So, if you do order the book, please um, go to IndieBound or Bookshop.org. Awesome. Unless well, you want the you ebook, so then I'm exclusive through Amazon. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Well, thank you so much for being here, and congratulations on thank all your you. successes. You know, going from two years old, starting to read, all the way to <laughs> you know doing what you're doing today, putting your books out there, your stories out there, and writing what you want to write. And I think that's yeah. such a beautiful thing. And uh, and then embarking on the new journey of outside of horror, which I can't wait to see what that's all about in a couple of years. I know. I feel like, I feel like that's the scary part for me. <laughs> right. Cause you're embarking on a whole new genre. It's a right? whole new genre. Writing. Yeah. Yeah. So excited to see what comes out of that. So everybody, again, go to jenniferangordon.com, get your copies today, and then make sure you leave a review for her so she can you know, keep those numbers going up. Jennifer, thanks so much for being here. I truly appreciate you and what Thank you're doing you. to make this world a better place by you know bringing out this entertainment for people <laughs> and giving them you know, ideas into this, this horror horror stuff, you know, and um, yeah. it's, it's a, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Thank, so thank you, you Linda. so much. Everybody have a great day. Thank you.